भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्र स्थिंगुवागसनूभि व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टनेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 so we are studying this third uh, chapter of the mandukya karika advaita prakaranam the chapter on non duality where gaudapada is attempting to prove on the basis of reasoning and experience uh, the that the self is non dual that there is one non dual reality non dual reality means without a second and what is this non dual reality it is you brahman or your brahman is your own self you are that non dual reality if there is only one reality without a second and you are that reality it means the claim is that there is there is no reality apart from you so all that appears to be apart from you right now all that appears to be apart from you this universe all these people all the things that you see in your life your own body and if you look inside your own thoughts so even up to the th- thoughts they all seem to be apart from you all of them cannot be apart from you why because you are that non dual reality without a second in that case the teaching is that that which appears to be apart from you is an appearance alone you are the reality which is appearing in this way which way here that reality which you are that existence consciousness bliss is appearing as jagat as you the jiva and also the god of religion ishvara jiva jagat ishvara is an appearance of that non dual self which you actually are this tremendous claim and those who can assimilate this that that which appears as anatma not the atma if you can dismiss it as an appearance and the atman alone is real that is the central teaching the discussion was going on about amani bhava no mind no mind we understood is not to stop thinking is to spiritualize the mind this knowledge which we have got the mind must assimilate that knowledge it must become a living reality for us it is a living reality we don't see it as that after understanding this after studying it um, shravana then think over it every possible objection must be answered your intellect must be absolutely satisfied and after that assimilate it make it real how do you do that how does mind become no mind how does this, how does it become a spiritualized mind the idea is to immerse the mind in this knowledge in this understanding of course that means the understanding must be already there we are now in the in the subject of meditation how to immerse the mind in then we say in what if you ask in what then go back to the, from the beginning you start all over again you must have this understanding this clarity then keep the mind in that clarity soak the mind immerse the mind let the mind soak in that clarity now there are those who can do it this is called this is called nididhyasana nididhyasana means vedantic meditation keeping the mind soaking the mind in that clarity um there are and this nididhyasana can be done in different ways one is um of course the traditional closed eye yogic meditation you can sit with closed eyes and meditate upon that clarity but vedantic meditation need not be done with closed eyes only that's the unique thing yogic meditation has to be done with closed eyes patanjali meditation you can't say that uh, i'm going to work and walk and talk and drive and cook um, and do meditation at the same time you cannot patanjali meditation yogic meditation means withdrawal from every other activity 
to focus on one thing only, to still the mind in one, one thought. So that is uh, Patanjali meditation, yogic meditation. And you can do that for Vedantic meditation also. This realization, I am the Turiya, I am Brahman. Every other thing apart from that is an appearance of uh, I myself. To stay with that only, shutting down all external activities, concentrating inwards with actually eyes closed. That you can do, that's what he's talking about. But remember, Vedantic meditation does not mean only that. Um, studying it again, keeping, studying it again and again, keeping your mind there, that's one kind of Vedantic meditation. In fact, there are texts which are designed for Nididhyasana, for Vedantic meditation. Um, Upanishads, like Mandukya Upanishad, is the original text. It is the source of all Vedanta. Every kind of, uh, all, all Vedanta flows from this. But there are other texts which are called Prakarana, introductory or, or independent works. Let's call it that. Some of them, some of these Prakaranas, they give you the entire teaching of Vedanta in a nutshell. So, Aparokshanubhuti, Vivek Chudamani, um, or the textbook which we use when we started learning Vedanta, Vedanta Sara. This give you an overall view of the Vedanta Shastra, you know, the teaching of the Vedanta. That's one kind. There is another kind of Prakarana Grantha, which is at which are advanced texts of um, dialectics, which are Manana Pradhana. That means they, uh, they take up all your doubts, even the subtlest questions you may have, and argue it out, argue it out intellectually. So these are polemical works, uh, dialectical works. And there are a number of these in Vedanta. M most famously, Khandana Khanda Khadya, uh, Advaita Siddhi, Tattva Pradipika, which is known as Chitsuki. Tremendous works. Like someone, someone said brain fryer. <laughs> you study them. Every possible question that you can think of, and many, many more that you can never think of also, have all been raised and argued out with, with tremendous detail. Um, so, I, you know Swami Atmapriyanandji ji who was here? Uh, just uh, last uh, week before last. So I remember, I told you this earlier, I once very tentatively asked him a question. When I was a, new, a novice, I asked him a question and I was feeling whether I should ask this question or not. And he said, go on, ask. Better minds than yours for centuries together have asked questions about Advaita Vedanta and have got satisfactory answers. So you don't need not be afraid that Advaita, will uh, Advaita Vedanta will come crashing down if you ask a question. Um, so, those are called dialectical works, Advait, uh, like Advaita Siddhi, Khandana Khanda Khadya, Chitsukhi and all. Then there are texts which are meant for meditation. So, Ashtavakra Gita, Avadhuta Gita, there, there is no attempt to explain the teaching. There is no attempt to explain the teaching. There is no attempt to even uh, argue out anything. There are no arguments, no reasoning, no argument, nothing is presented there. Just the final conclusion, Siddhanta, that is told again and again, you are Brahman, that non-dual reality, the world is an appearance, that's told to you again and again and again and again. What's the point of that? The point is, once you've got clarity, stay with it. So that's also Vedantic meditation. That's with eyes open. Um, but there are those, and m most people, th th this thing is possible for the Uttama Adhikari, for the, uh, the most qualified seeker. They can make the jump directly. You teach them, argue it out, they stay with it and enlightened. They go so far as to say, Shravana Deva Gyanam, directly by, by the teaching, Tattva Masi, they become enlightened that, yes, I am that. But for most of us, um, what we need is a course of actual sitting, eyes closed meditation. So, Vedanta also adapts the whole Patanjali Yoga. It takes all of that and uses it, adapts it for this meditation. So, what's, what Gaudapada is now talking about is for that second group of Adhikaris, of seekers, who, for whom if you teach it, argue it out and clarity is done, you still keep saying that stay with it and it will be done. They say, no, I, I understand it. I am convinced. I understand it. 
If you at this stage you say, no, 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 I'm not convinced, then one step down, no, 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 go back to the reasoning state. Say, what should I reason about? Oh, then go back to the beginning of the class. <laughs> Hearing. <coughs> yes. Or was I lost the thread? Mm. Go back to the second category. Second, second category of uh, meditation. Second Adhikari. Madhyam Adhikari. Madhyam Adhikari. Not Madhyam Adhikari. Go back to the first category. Yeah, but um, what about the Madhyam Adhikari? What was it trying to say? Meditation that keeps you in the. It doesn't teach good, you. Good, this is a good way of teaching. Maybe if you are quiet, you can make it faster. So Madhikari doesn't need eyes closed. Yeah, that is true. Sit down. You know, normally people don't teach Vedanta like this. In traditional Vedanta, the teacher won't even look at you, won't even talk at you. You take up the text, read it, explain it, whether you're coming, going. In the Indian, uh, I mean, it's actually this is much calmer than most Indian uh, uh, the, the schools where uh, teaching is going on. People are coming, sitting down, getting up and going. That happens. And that's not a problem. Uh, there are sometimes hundreds of people. But the style of teaching is not like that. Not like this. Where I'm trying to interact with you or connect with you. The problem of a teacher trying to connect with you is the teacher is easily distracted and thrown off. <laughs> Unless the students are serious. So, um, Gaurapada here is talking about that second group of seekers who need meditation. The traditional meditation, hours, every day, regularly, until you are convinced that yes, I am uh, Brahman. It is a fact. Not just an understanding, not just something theoretical, but it's a fact. So until that point, this meditation is prescribed. And Gaurapada has been talking about that. And you remember he pointed out obstacles. If you remember four types of obstacles, what are they? Laya. Laya, the mind going to sleep. Vikshepa, the mind getting scattered. Kashaya, kashaya, the mind getting sort of paralyzed, maybe due to past samskaras or uh, de strong desires or whatever. And then? Rasaswada, the mind tasting uh, happiness, peace, bliss. Not a very spiritual thing, but uh, I mean, which, which sort of distracts you from the ultimate uh, ananda, from, from, from realizing yourself as that ananda, where you try to enjoy the ananda in the mind. So these are the four obstacles. Um, laya, vikshepa. So the mind is like a, first of all, m most common problem is vikshepa. Mind is scattered and mind keeps going out into the world. So a monk compared it to a restless child, you know, always willing, to, always wanting to rush outside the house and see what's happening out there. And you have to forcibly restrain the kid back, back into the home. But even if you restrain the kid back at home, the kid will rush to the window and look out. So this is the nature of Vikshepa. If you let it, then the mind will keep you busy, engaged with the world continuously day in and day out until you, you fall asleep. So from morning till night. And that's the mind rushing outside. It will tell you, go there, see that, eat that, meet that person, do this, do that, enjoy this, suffer that. <laughs> All of it will go on. Come on in, come on in, come on in. Who's got a seat next to them? Just raise your hand. Okay. Um, so... That's one, one thing that the kid does. If you forcibly uh, uh, keep the kid confined to the house, what will the kid do? It will rush to the window and look outside. If you forcibly keep the mind confined, no, 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 this is the time for meditation. Sit quietly, eyes closed. Then the mind is like look, going to the windows and looking outside. The mind is eagerly thinking. It keep on thinking. What's going on there? What could I do? Even though you're not allowing it to actually do something. That is weak shape, a scattered mind. Can't meditate. So maybe... The kid's favorite team is playing a game and you tell the kid, no, no, you have to do your homework, your assignment uh, and study. So the kid is sitting there, the, the child is sitting there, but 
his uh, favorite team is playing and the mind is completely there. Though actually physically he's not seeing the match or seeing the game, but the mind is running there. That happens when the strong desires are there and the mind keeps running outwards. That is Vikshepa. And the other, other extreme is Layaha. Um, somebody says, no, no, this uh, young guy, he doesn't run outside the house. He is very relaxed. In fact, too relaxed. All the time on his hammock or something. Is so this is the opposite. Doesn't want to go anywhere. Fallen asleep. Laya. Laya is um, sleep. Um, so the mind sometimes falls off to sleep. That's also not meditation. Though it might be deceptively. <laughs> and then there is uh, Kashaya. And we discussed all that. And Rasa Aswada. When a mind attains a very sattvic, calm state. Sometimes there is a, not sometimes, there automatically will be a great joy and peace in the mind. And the mind wants to stay with that. But that's not enlightenment. Now Gaudapada is giving us ways to overcome these problems. Remember, he is talking about Vedantic meditation. I am Brahman. I am that reality, non-dual reality, to stay with that. But the other kinds of meditation that we do, many of us, we have got a mantra, mantra diksha. When we practice that, same problems will come up. Laya, Vikshepa, Kashaya, Rasaswada. And the same solutions will work. So it's, even if you are not doing Advaitic meditation, if you are doing say Mantra and uh, Ishta Devata meditation, these problems will come and these, re- these solutions also work. So what are the solutions? I mentioned them last time, right? That's what Gaurapada is going to talk about. 43. Dukkham sarvam manusmritya Dukkham sarvam manusmritya Kama bhoga nivartayet Kama bhoga nivartayet Ajam sarvam manusmritya Ajam sarvam manusmritya Jatam naiva tu pashyati Jatam naiva tu pashyati here, Gaudapada is giving us two powerful methods of dealing with desires in the mind. These ones which cause vikshepa, scattering of the mind outwards. So things which attract us in the world outside. That's what, that's what ma- makes the mind run to the world. Two ways of dealing with it. Not just attract us, fear and temptation both. Anxiety and attraction both. Both will make the mind disturbed and run out to the world. How to control that? How to get over that? So Gaurapada gives two powerful methods. One, Vairagya and second, Jnana Bhyasa. One is Vairagya, dispassion. Another one is the practice that is staying with the knowledge. Jnana Bhyasa. We will see how that works. First one, Vairagya. Dukkham Sarva Manusmritya. Considering the, sor- the sorrowful, the Dukkha nature of all experiences in the world. Kama bhogat nivartayet. Withdraw, turn away from trying to uh, enjoy the objects of desire. Kama bhoga means enjoying objects of desire. Turn away from trying to enjoy the objects of desire. Why do we put so much effort into getting things we did? Why do we desire something? Why do we put effort into getting something we desire? Because we feel it will give us pleasure. We feel it will make me happy. That's why we do the, put forth so much effort. That's why we keep on thinking about those things and we want them. And they seem to give us some happiness also. But notice, none of that happiness is ever fulfilling. And none of it stays. None of it stays. First law of the, which we study in economics, first class in economics, diminishing marginal utility. <laughs> Every added item of consumption gives you less and less satisfaction until it becomes zero or even negative. So that is the very nature of the world. Nothing here is ultimately fulfilling. Not only is it not fulfilling, to get those objects, there is a lot of suffering involved. There is a lot of effort involved. When you get, when you, if, you, if you do not get it, there is frustration. And if you get the things you want, there is the anxiety of maintaining them. There is the anxiety of adding to them. And there is a fear of losing them. And after you have got it, if you get it, and if you have enjoyed it, samskara will be put in your mind. A tendency to repeat that enjoyment. And in more varieties. In, in different forms. 
and that leads to further unhappiness. That's why Bhagavan Buddha, so when uh, he talks about Dukkha, Sarvam Dukkham, all is suffering. We normally think, yes, there's a lot of suffering in the world, but there is some happiness also in the world. And so somehow if I can tactfully get rid of that suffering and catch hold of that little happiness, that should be the way to manage my life. Bhagavan Buddha says, doomed attempt. Doomed attempt. Foolishness. There is suffering, nobody denies that. And Bhagavan Buddha says, yes, before enjoyment suffering, after enjoyment suffering. During enjoyment, underneath that there is suffering in the form of anxiety, lack of fulfillment. In fact, so, uh, enjoyment is only su suffering in disguise. So, Buddha is sort of rains on your parade, right? <laughs> no, fulfillment is possible. Not that Buddha is actually ultimately pessimistic, not at all. He is an optimist. Fulfillment is possible in nirvana, in transcendence, but not in this samsara, not in this way. That's what Buddha wants to say. So, Kama Bhoga. Turn away from trying to enjoy objects of, uh, chasing objects of, uh, or desirable objects. Because they will not lead to fulfillment. Dukkham sarvam anusmritya. Dwe anusmritya means continuously dwell upon this truth. That every object of enjoyment in the world, which I have enjoyed till now, which I have seen other people enjoy till now, ultimately has not yet led to any lasting satisfaction. And has led to sorrow. And has led to, it creates trouble. Psychologically, socially, financially, in every way in the future. So thinking about this, what happens is, the mind becomes convinced. Alright, here are these nice things floating about in my awareness. Let me reach out and grasp them. No. Why? Dukkham. Alright, but that one is nice. Dukkham. But that one must be nice. I mean, after all, uh, what, what I saw, saw Google or somewhere, they have put a lot of advertisement in a new phone which has come out. I even got an advertisement that you buy this new phone. I bought a new phone just a few months ago and that phone is now telling me the advertisement buy a new, another new phone. <laughs> Dukkham. They should name the phone Dukkham. <laughs> This is one powerful way. Uh, Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita says, Janma mrityu jara vyadi dukkha doshanu darshanam etad jnanam iti proktam agyanam yadatu anyatha It says, birth, death, old age and disease. See the sorrow inherent in all of them. If you can notice, if you can recognize this sorrow inherent in all of them, etad jnanam iti proktam, this is called knowledge. And then he says, agyanam yad ato anyatha, that which is other than this is ignorance. What is other than this? To see joy in, ah, birth. No, 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 sorrow. <laughs> Death, everybody more or less agrees sorrow. But... Birth and death are causally connected. Jatasya hi dhruvo mrityu. Of, the, of those that are born, death is certain. Guaranteed. What is the guaranteed death sentence? Birth. Yes, that is true. So, sorrow. Old age is sorrow. Oh, Swami, you are running us down. Uh, no, but it is true. As the body begins to slow down, things which are you never gave a second thought to when you were in your teens or in your 20s, 30s, everything requires management now. It's a managed decline. <laughs> One doctor told me that modern medita medicine, Swami, we can guarantee, if you've got the money, the right insurance, we can guarantee you're going to live long. But we can cannot guarantee that you will live well. <laughs> so... Um, they can't even guarantee you're going to live long. There's no question of that. But you can try. Jara, old age. Vyadhi. Vyadhi means disease. Of course it's sorrow. Of course it's sorrow. Old age is sorrow. Disease is sorrow. And finally death is sorrow. And no, no. Birth is good. No, but directly leads to these ones. <laughs> so, 
to see the sorrow inherent in all of that. This is wisdom. I think there was a quote which the Professor Arindam Chakravarti he mentioned. He said, to the sensitive mind, it means he means the philosophical mind, everything is sorrow. Unless it's spirit, uh, something high and noble and spiritually fulfilling, yes. Addiction. It's sorrow, yes. So addiction is sorrow. In a way, old age is an addiction. In a way, the, the way that you have to deal with it. it would you say that? Well, okay, I'm, I'm going at it myself. I, if you have an addiction, hmm. um, it's a more complex problem. Yes. Perhaps. But um, is, is there a kind of meditation that's better for someone who is trapped in one of those things? Yes, we'll see. Come on in. Yes, I think there's space here. Yes, addiction is sorrow. And it's very interesting that you would bring up the uh, question of addiction. Because why do people get addicted? You get addicted in the pursuit of, of pleasure, of happiness. Nobody gets addicted to something when under the firm conviction that I'm going to be unhappy. No. You get addicted to something because it initially promises pleasure. This is Rajasik pleasure. In the Bhagavad Gita it is said, Yatta Dagre Amrita Upamam Pariname Vishamiva. That which is like nectar in the beginning and the result is like poison. In, the, in, the, in consequence it's like poison. So the nature of addiction, Sri Ramakrishna gives the example, of the man who jumped into the river, there was a flood and he saw something like an expensive rug flowing past and he thought, why should it go to waste? Let me go and swim strongly against the, the, the flow and catch hold of it and rescue it and bring it back. When he goes up to it, he realizes it's a bear which was being swept along in the flood waters. And what does the bear do if you try to get hold of it? It, it gets hold of you. Bear hug. <laughs> So it caught hold of the man and the man was being swept away and the people on the shore shouted, let go of the rug, let go of the rug, we are going to drown. And he shouted back, I let go of it, it doesn't let go of me. <laughs> come, come, who's got a uh, seat next to me? You've got a seat here, right here. Everybody's accumulating in the back end of the, you know, like a class, we used to always... <laughs> Avoid the front row and sit, sit at the back. <laughs> In Hindi, Kambal ko to mene chhod diya. Kambal nahi chhodta hai. I let go of the rug or the blanket. The blanket doesn't let go of me. But that's the nature of addiction. I caught hold of it at one time. Now it's caught hold of me. And those, and it's a big problem, especially in the West now. And it's coming to India also. Um, people get addicted and it's like a, being possessed by a ghost. Um, you think, I am making the decision and I can come out of it, but you can't. Already, uh, it's, you've been taken over, as if. So, this is one powerful, come, this is one powerful method of overcoming this pursuit of objects of desire. Why is it a powerful method? Remember, we pursue these objects in the hope of pleasure. In the hope of pleasure. If you are some way convinced, at least you begin to see that no, there is pain and suffering associated with these things. Every bit of, everything that we think will give us worldly pleasure. There is pain and suffering associated with it. Then we will draw back from that. This turning away. Automatically you turn away from experiences which give you unhappiness. The experiences which seem to promise happiness, you will also turn away from that if you, if you are convinced that it also is dukkha, hidden in that. This is one method. This is called Vairagya. Remember, why are we trying to do, do this? It's not an end in itself. The end is to meditate. Otherwise, vikshep, or the, mind, the first problem, the mind will get scattered. Second problem. Now, a more powerful method. More powerful method. Second method. Ajam sarvam manusmritya jatam naiva tupashyati. Reflect upon the teaching that you have got till now. In Mandukya, from Mandukya Upanishad. The first chapter, second chapter, now in the third chapter. This, this entire teaching, reflect upon it. That which you seem to think is an object, desirable object outside. 
which I will think about, which I will yearn for, which I will try to pursue and finally get it and enjoy it. What you are thinking? Is it not an illusion? Remember the princess of Kashi. You alone are appearing in this way. The entire world that you see in the waking state, the entire world that you see in the dream state and the darkness of the deep sleep, they are nothing but you the Atma. You the Turiya, you are appearing in these ways. You alone appear as the object and the subject which experiences the object. Both subject and object are not real. You are the reality. When you reflect upon this, that the object I am pursuing is not a real independent entity out there, which I must get, add to myself to make myself happy. No, no such thing. It's an appearance in me, the consciousness. It is nothing apart from me then the, the desire for getting that itself will drop away. Because the desire is based on foolishness, on ignorance. The desire itself will drop away. Mithyatva, looking at the falsity of that. If somebody says, so how much desire do you have for the million dollars you won in lottery in the last night's dream? Nothing. Nothing. Yes, Swami, it was all nice till you said last night's dream. <laughs> Million dollars, you won lottery, oh great, great, great. In last night's dream, oh, the whole thing is gone now. Why? It's still a million dollars, you still won it, still it was a lottery. It's not real. It's not real. The moment something is not real, all its desirability, that what makes it worthwhile to pursue, stops. It still looks like the same thing, it feels like the same thing, but it's not real. The things which you see on the cinema. Yeah. I have given the example earlier, the first and the only 3D movie I ever saw when we were kids. It was back in India, you have to put on glasses to see 3D effects. And there were this plate of Indian sweets, laddu. And it would float out of the screen and <laughs> enticingly dance before your no very no nose. And the kids in the cinema hall, they were, you know, like swiping at it and they were giggling. But nobody was unhappy that they couldn't get it. They know it was just, it's just a trick. So it's just fun. So in the same way, all these things, the world, the enticingly dancing before your nose, it's just that. It's not real. That story I have told you earlier also. I'm sorry to repeat them, but they're worthwhile to listen again and again in context. The monk... <coughs> I was studying Ashtavakra under him in Gangotri, in, um, in the Himalayas. So, um, he had never seen a TV before, a TV set before. So, they, once a TV crew came to uh, Gangotri and they wanted to show him how a TV works, television set. So, they hooked up a generator and they put a camera and the television set in front of the Swami. And they cranked up the generator and they showed him the picture of the Ganga in the TV set. And uh, the Swami was telling us, he was like a delighted little boy, he was, he was in his 80s. And he said, oh I could see, oh monks, I could see everything, I could see the holy Ganges and I could hear the gurgling sound of the water. Sab dikhta hai Mahatma ji, Ganga ji dikhti hai, pani ki kal kalahat bhi sunai deti hai. You can hear all of that and you can see the water. And then, then he said to the film crew director. My dear sir, can you give me a glass of water? Babu is saying, lota Ganga jal Can you give me a glass of water from this wonderful Ganga in your little box? <laughs> and the man laughed and he said, Oh Swami, what are you saying? There's nothing here, it just looks like that. Isme hai kuch nahi, dikhta hai. It looks like that. And then the Swami looked at all of us, I still remember, with a thrill, you know, he swept, he's sweeping, he showed the mountains and the caves and, and the glaciers and the Ganga ran, running down just below us and the Deodar forests and he said to ye sab mahatma ji kuch nahi hai, dikhta hai all of this dear monks it looks like that it looks like that means you can see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it it's not real Swami how can that be if you can see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it it's not real think about your dreams don't you see the things there? Don't you hear sounds? Don't you taste and touch? And yet, not real. Not real. Just because only it is a screen and you are just seeing it, 
That's why it's not real, no. Then people added sound to it. First, they were only silent movies. Then they made it color. They first added sound, talkies. And then they uh, added color to it. Did it become real? No. And now I hear there's something called 4D or something where they have added uh, motion. So you can sit in the chair and watching the movie. So when the car is moving or the train is moving, your uh, chair will also shake. Mm. Chair will also shake. Um, now suppose they add something more. Smell. Smell. <laughs> and that they did that. I heard in um, somebody's phone or something. Somebody, somebody is vibrating there. Um, yeah, I heard in Disneyland or somewhere. So it's a big screen and um, and they will someday show a flower and the chair, in your chair there will be a little tube which will squirt a burst of yeah. fragrance and you'll smell it. You can not only see it, hear it, but also smell it. And now they're thinking about haptic sen sensors on your gloves, which means it will give, if you're trying to hold a cup in 3D, you're wearing those goggles, and you can see a table and a cup and you reach out to hold, hold the cup and the sensors on your uh, uh, glove will generate pressure so you feel like you're holding something yeah. and lift it is it real no you are tough customers what else will it take to satisfy you that it's real <laughs> it's magic but it's not real it's still not real all five senses, you can give fullest input to the five senses, still not real, it's, it's generated. Now, there's a Vedantic experiment. Suppose you add a little more to it. You can actually see what the hero of the movie is seeing, hear what he is hearing, uh, smell, taste, touch, all of that you're feeling. And you, you have totally, you have no sensation of your own body sitting in the cinema hall now, suppose. You're just in the skin of the character in the movie. How real that would feel. Now add one more thing to it. Suppose you could, you could sense the thoughts of the hero, all the emotions of the hero. And not so difficult to imagine. In a very good movie, you, you actually um, sympathize with the actors and you cry and laugh and all of that you do. So it's not difficult to recreate the emotions. Suppose you feel the emotions, the thoughts of the character, the emotions of the character, and you lose sight of what you are, sitting on the chair and watching a movie then will it not feel absolutely real? And yet it won't be real. That is tremendous. Not particularly tremendous. Every night you do it in your dreams. You do exactly this in your dreams. It's still not real. He says, moment you realize it's not real, even while you're seeing it, hearing it, smelling it, tasting it, the desire for it will not be there. This is called, this is a deeper method. Jnana Abhyasa, he says, Ajam Sarvam Anusmritya. So, Gaudapada has its own uh, terminology. Ajam. Did you have a question? Yes. Is there a Vedantic commentary on like Oshadi? Because there's a lot of people who talk about herbs and things like that, ayahuasca trips and stuff uh, for radical experiences. Is that fall into the realm of not real? Of course, it's not real. You shouldn't even have to ask what's real in Vedanta? What's real? Satchidananda, consciousness alone is real. Existence alone is real. Any object is unreal. That which is object by virtue of being an object, unreal. That which is limited by virtue of being limited is unreal. That which comes and goes by virtue of being temporary is unreal. Vishayatvad, Jadatvad, Parichinnatvad, Anityatvad, Asat. Ajam Sarvam, Gaudapada has his own terminology. Instead of saying false, he says unborn. Ajam. So the, the Ajati Vada. Ajam means Brahman alone exists. It is not an effect. It, it never comes as an effect. Uh, it is not a cause of the universe. So the universe is never really born from Brahman. It's not a second thing which is born from Brahman. It's an appearance in Brahman. It's not real in itself. So the very word Ajam Sarvam, everything. He says everything, 
at the same time unborn everything unborn means then brahman alone is the reality right not very difficult to understand also take another example a movie you see people there car chase you know hollywood car chase cops and robbers uh, you can see the hollywood sign there and uh, i actually saw it that's why i'm telling <laughs> i was in a, in a hollywood suddenly there was shooting uh, outside the monastery in, in our parking lot and we ran outside me i thought maybe there was some kind of and the shooting was a hollywood kind of shooting <laughs> I, I, when i ran out i saw this car come screeching into the our parking lot and this lady she in a long overcoat she walks by whips out a gun and starts shooting <laughs> and then they go cut <laughs> and that was it, it was like the 10th or 12th take they had just for that little sequence anyhow huh. hollywood see i lose lose track <laughs> lost track of <laughs> ajam unborn so when you see when you finally see the effects on the screen you will see car and the lady coming and shooting and the hollywood sign there and maybe a monk coming out and looking like this <laughs> <laughs> all the time what's there only the screen on which you are watching the movie then can you not say ajam sarvam sarvam all this that you see the car and the people and the shooting and the monk and the hollywood sign and all of it ajam unborn what the screen is just the screen it has never become these things but all of them appear knowing this ajam sarvam naiva tu pashyatam naiva tu pashyat you do not see a real thing there if you do not see a real thing no desire desire immediately disappears this is a very powerful deep radical method of uh, of transcending desires use these two methods by the way what he has done here is nothing more than what krishna has said to arjuna in the bhagavad gita in the 6th chapter when he teaches meditation and arjuna has this objection is very difficult to concentrate the mind a universal objection to meditation my mind runs here and there you see ah problem number 2 vikshepa mind is scattered scattered mind what is sri krishna's answer krishna's solution he says asamshayam mahabaho mano durnigraham chalam you are right o mighty prince the mind is difficult mind is fickle and difficult to control but abhyasena tu kaunteya vairagyena cha grihyate the mind comes under control by two things one is vairagya step 1 hmm? seeing everything as dukkham and step 2 abhyasa by practice there krishna has given a general term abhyasa you will ask what abhyasa krishna would say whatever your abhyasa is here gorapada is much more precise he says abhyasa here means in the context of mandukya seeing the appearance nature the unborn nature of all those things especially the things you find desirable and the things things that that you find scary that which is ca- causing anxiety in you ajam sarvam nothing to you an appearance that which is causing attraction whether it's anxiety or attraction fear or fascination they are ajam sarvam what is it to you you alone are there because of you all of these are appearing horror movie or comedy movie it's a movie so exactly what krishna has said but krishna has given the general case here godapada gives a specific uh, technique yes Hmm. in objects but how can see dosha in tremendous engagement in flow that dosha means dosha means like problematics like underlying uh, suffering yes in engagement and flow in a but engagement and flow in, in what engagement people find engagement and flow um, you can fly play tennis you can um, um, one person can get a lot of flow in eating the things he likes Uh, or whatever in many worldly activities you can get tremendous engagement and if the purpose there is by this i will be satisfied will you be satisfied by this no temporarily one may be very engaged in it job satisfaction you know you're doing good well but at the end of it it is not satisfaction does not lie there during the activity you, you cannot do this this must be something that insight must be there all the time 
So when it's necessary, if the activity is there, you have to do it. If it's a job, you have to do it. If it's a family, you have to take care of it. If it's your own health, your own personal finances, you have to take care of it. But to think that my satisfaction lies in this, I will get fulfillment from this, uh, I will get purnatvam, completion from this. No. There is suffering before this, there is suffering during this, and the consequence of this is also suffering. Be sure about it. Every activity in the world is pervaded by, uh, by unhappiness. Um, proof, look at our own lives. In spite of our best efforts, what is the whole project of my life? To make I, me, myself happy. That's my one-pointed project. Show me one exception. He said, no, Mahatma Gandhi, mother. No, they also had exactly the same project. They just did it more wisely than us. They realized that identifying yourself with the larger masses, um, doing things for others, makes I, me, myself more happy. So to make I, me, myself happy, that's my project. How are we doing? After 20 years of trying that, 40 years of trying that, 60 years of trying that, 95 years of trying that, how are we doing? Progress report. I can, without knowing anything about you, I can guarantee you one thing, that all our efforts which we have done in, in, a, in, in the samsar, in the worldly sense, will not give the desired results. But if you have done anything spiritual, that will give, to that extent you will get, get positive results from it. Yes. Swami, this is the Buddha's teachings and you're, you're teaching us this too, so it's very hard to say anything against it. Yes. But the concept of Sarvam Dukkham yes. is very pessimistic to me at least. Uh -huh. There is the way we lead our life, there are, there are, there are, there are joys, there are pains and there are pleasures. And most people here know that that is part of life. Yes. If all our life was only pain, yes. then that would be the only state. And there would be, that, that would be life. Right? Yes. There, there would be no other state. If we knew that everything is sorrow, mm. come, yes. then that is your life. Yes. Right? It's no, there's no pleasure. It's just all pain. Yes. The reason we have pain is because we have pleasure. Mm -hmm. So why can't we aspire uh, to, to basically navigate and treasure me with <laughs> pleasure and pain? Yeah. And come to Mandukya class. Right. And aspire to figure out what is it the greater purpose of life is and what is it this is about us, right? And is this real or not real? And what is truly real? And the happinesses and the sorrows we feel are all very fleeting. They're yes. Not permanent. Right. Tennis match win, you understand, is good for the minute you want, but it's not permanent happiness. Why can't we lead our life with that balance as opposed to saying Sarvam Dukkham? But what you said is balance is that Sarvam Dukkham. You see, cut out the spiritual insight from this doesn't have to come from Mandukya, it can come from Buddha, it can come from just a mature, a person reaching some maturity in life. If you remove that, think of a um, young person, um, healthy, educated, enthusiastic, and also very worldly. And this is where I'll get my fulfillment. Will he or she get fulfillment in this world? No. 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 But most people here realize that. Most people here realize that. That's what I would argue. Yeah, most people here, re right, most people here realize that. Most people outside don't realize that. Even if they do realize it, you know what is the thing, what is the conclusion they come to without thinking about it? The conclusion they come to is, well, this is the way it is, nothing more to be done. Do the best you can in this world. Isn't the conclusion that most people come to outside, those who are not spiritual in some sense. But Buddha, that is pessimism. Buddha is not pessimistic. What is pessimism? Yeah, I thought I'm going to be really happy in this world. And I had the means to do it, but it hasn't quite worked out that way. And most people now I realize are unhappy. And very soon I'm going to get old and sick and die. And I guess this is all that there is to it. Well, what to do? This is life. Um, make the best of it. Let's manage things. This is the way, brand name. I mean, this is card carrying pessimism. Buddha says just the opposite. He says there is something beyond this. Every spiritual path says that. Whether it's Buddha or Vedanta or Christianity or Islam, or whatever kind of spirituality, religion you talk about. The whole promise is there that there is a solution to this world problem. There are those who don't realize it, ignorant children, they rush into it. Then they get knocks and then they come to a kind of maturity. But that maturity for most people is, well, I couldn't have it. Let me get the little, snatch the little bits of pleasure out of the jaws of death and suffering 
and that's how I'll pass my life. That is pessimism. But what is being promised here by Mandukya, what is being promised by the Buddha or Christ or Ramakrishna is that real, true satisfaction is possible. It's not impossible. It is really possible. And that is what spirituality is. Dukkha nivritti, transcendence of sorrow, ananda prapti, attainment of bliss, not a little fleeting pleasure in the world, true lasting happiness, as dem demonstrated by the great saints and masters in sp spiritual life and religions throughout the world. That is the promise. And what you have said just now that it's not all suffering. It is quite a lot of happiness here. Uh, that's true. That's what it seems like to the unreflective. To most of us, it seems like that. And that's a very Hindu attitude. Hindus don't say that. That's all suffering. Hindus say sukha dukkha. How do you, do, how do you manage it then? Oh, um, um, you have got... Punya, good karma leads to sukha, papa, bad karma leads to dukkha and if you want to have a better life then do a lot of good karma, avoid uh, bad karma and you will get a more or less pleasant life. Oh, but death is there. Don't worry, we have got that, uh, we have got that <laughs> taken care of too. Beyond death lies heaven, swarga and many categories of swarga. So do more of these rituals, with give me my commission and do more of these rituals after death, you are also guaranteed a very pleasant life in multiple swargas. This is the Hindu idea. Of what? For those who seek conventional religion. Buddha, he takes one step, he jumps over this whole process. He knows this is, this, there is nothing to this. This is also samsara, extended improved samsara. He says, is there any, any true solution to the problem of samsara? That's what he asks. Swami Tapasyanji used to say, Swami Atmapriyanji told me, he would say that Buddhism is a serious religion. It starts when you accept sarvam dukkham. He said, no, but sarvam dukkham is not true. Not true when you don't think about it. But when you think about it, upon reflection, that which seemed to be sukha is just prolonging your misery. If the sukha inevitably ends in dukkha, if pleasure, happiness inevitably ends in dukkha, then isn't it dukkha? Just because we have postponed that dukkha a little bit, when that comes, then it's as if that sukha never was, that happiness never was. So, more you think about it, Buddha has a lot of reasons to it. If you, if you study the Buddhist text, they'll convince you about it. You'll go into a nice depression after reading that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, Hinduism gives a more gradual, uh, like an escalator slowly going up. Buddhism is an elevator that way. If, if you take it in the, in the, in the sense, direct, direct spiritual. Buddha is speaking about direct spirituality. In Hinduism, suppose you say, no, no, I have had enough of that roundabout, going round and round and round. And even pleasant life is beginning to get boring for me. Then... Then he says, all right. And you ask, do you have anything else? <laughs> then the, like a shopkeeper who says, come to the back of the shop. I, I've got the special stuff for you. And he'll take out, here is Mandukya. <laughs> <laughs> so Hinduism divided its scriptures into Karmakanda, Jnanakanda. The ritualistic portion, which is meant to have a nice life here and a nice life hereafter. But like a nice improved samsara. And that's good. Many people are satisfied with it. Many people are satisfied with it. The large numbers of people who queue up in the Ganesha temple and all that. For what? For moksha. Ajam sarvam manuspriti. No, no, not at all. My God. It will uh, be horrifying if you tell them that. No, no, everything should be good. Family life should be good. Job should be good. Uh, green card should be there. All of that <laughs> is to be guaranteed. Who will guarantee? Vinayaka. Ganesha will guarantee. Offer these pujas, repeat these mantras, good. And there is nothing wrong in that. Mass religion is like that throughout the world. You see the long queues in the big cathedrals and all. Are they all going for uh, salvation in Christ? No, no, no. Good life, good society, good life. Blessings of God. Carry on this life. Die so that you may find eternal life in me. My God, terrifying. <laughs> if you take actually the, the teachings of the Christ and the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, 
you will empty half the churches. People will run away. The core teachings of the Christ are absolutely spiritual. So, yeah, that's Vedanta. Quickly. Swamiji, being in this room can also be hard because, uh, you know, there's so much talk. I, I know you say in a certain way about death, for example. And if you're not um, committed to this practice, and if you just listen passively to it, um, this could be double-edged. It could be, in, like, if you follow through it, it can be um, very empowering. Uh, but if you don't, then it can be very depressing, too. Well, that's a blessed depression. Because <laughs> on, on the other side of it, see, if I'm depressed about dying, what can I do? I can't kill myself. Because that's what I'm depressed about. <laughs> then I can, they can, only I can think about Transcending death, about then what is the recommendation in the Upanishads, Gita, religions, what do they tell us? Take a look at that. Yes, at first it can be depressing. But we are all committed in one sense or the other. Why should you be there here on a Wednesday afternoon? In one sense we are all committed. There is certain amount of maturity to be had, uh, some amount of maturity, spiritual maturity, to sit and listen to this. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And to actually like it. There are people who would find it intolerable. There are people who would find it boring. People who find it intolerable. People who find it... You know. See, Uttarakhand, the way they speak, the Hindi, um, I'll translate. One um, person goes to a Swami. Actually, that person said later on, a great teacher of non-duality. The way we say, these are the qualifications for Vedanta, we say. Instead of saying those things, he said, the, the Swami said to that person who had come, Panditji, kama na ho to kama ke ao, bhog na ho to bhog ke ao. If you want to earn money, go and earn money and come back. If you want to experience things in the world, you know, pleasures and all, go and experience things and come back. Mukti to chutki mein milegi aapko. Liberation is there in a snap of a finger. But those things are samsara. Those things are not liberation and liberation is not those things. If you want a um, nice healthy body, a yoga studio is there. If you want um, to be like very rich, um, Wall Street is there, try your luck. Remember again, all of these things, just because it's there, not that you'll get it. Karma must be there, good karma must be there. If you want to be famous, Hollywood is there. If you want to be very learned, Columbia University is there. And all of them have their process. They have their own dharma and practice. Go and do it. That is not moksha. Moksha is something separate. Those things take effort, time, karma, and all of them are subject to end. The only thing you will come away from those is with a little bit of experience. Yes. Swamiji, can't one keep the teaching, you know, that you've taught us? really all of this is an appearance and with that foundation or within that framework whatever pleasure one gets I mean now I'm talking about you know ethical pleasure obviously mm. enjoying that knowing that it's absolutely an absolutely no Dukha also, sure also knowing that it's just an appearance yes so yes absolutely that but you're already saying that on the basis of Vedantic knowledge yeah. Yeah. You can't, just because you read this, you can't stop life. Life will continue. Now what do you do? Now you use this knowledge to face life. Even the pleasures, he will say, don't get attached. Even the pains, don't take it too seriously. How can you not get attached? How can you not take it seriously on the basis of this knowledge? Even before you are enlightened. Just because you come to the class, life will not stop. When you step outside the world, it's life is there. So all of us will keep on living our lives. But what bearing will this knowledge have? It helps you. In fact, Upanishad, the meaning of the word Upanishad, in Katha Upanishad commentary, Shankaracharya says, there are three meanings. All three are correct. Shader Dhatur, he says, Visharana Gati Avasadhanartha. Visharana Gati Avasadhanartha. Gati means, it takes you to Brahman. That means it makes you realize you are Brahman. Upanishad makes you do that. Visharana means it destroys. It destroys ignorance. And um, Avasadhana No, Avasadhana means to, to destroy ignorance. Visharana means to uh, reduce, to loosen. 
it loosens the bonds of samsara. Even before you're enlightened, you will see you, uh, samsara weighs less heavily on you because of this knowledge. Otherwise, samsara seems so, pardon the exp expression, so damn serious. It's no longer that serious anymore. Because you have found something more, something deeper, something more profound, something, something more uh, important beyond samsara. You have found the screen on which the movie is playing. At least you have, we have got the intimation of it, that there is such a thing. That's what religion tries to do, spirituality. All right, let's move a little further. I wanted to finish it. <laughs> We've done only one verse. By a combination of these two, Vairagya removes this thirst for pleasure by showing there is no pleasure. We are automatically we are afraid of pain. So Vairagya shows us there is pain only waiting there for you. And Jnana, the, the second one, shows us it's not real anyway. It's not real anyway. What are you chasing? A mirage. Of course, it's easy to say. When you try it out, you'll see how difficult it is. It's difficult because of our conditioning. Then, the four obstacles, uh, how do you handle them? He will tell us in the next few verses. 40, 44. Laye sambodhaye chittam Laye sambodhaye chittam Vikshiptam shamayet punaha Vikshiptam shamayet punaha Sakashayam vijaniyat Sakashayam vijaniyat Sampraptam na chalayet Sampraptam na chalayet Simple solutions. So if the mind falls asleep, Sambodhayet, awaken. <laughs> Vikshiptam, if the mind is scattered, Shamayet, quieten it. Sakashayam vijaniyat. So if the mind is paralyzed or, or entranced by, I, I told you last time, there are complexes deep in our subconscious. Strong desires, guilt, trauma, many things are there in past life, uh, in our life itself. So meditation sometimes brings those up. And the mind, as it were, like a serpent entranced by the flute of the serpent player, it gets stuck there. It can't think of anything else. Sometimes those things happen. Sometimes, some, if you're lucky, you're free of those things. But uh, mostly sleep or disturbed mind, uh, that is scattered mind, these two are the main problems. But then this is another kind of uh, problem where the mind is fixed, but not fixed on the spiritual thing. Not on what you are meditating upon, but on this thing which has, which has boiled up from deep inside. The only thing you can do is, Vijaniyat. Remain in your awareness that I am the witness consciousness. This is nothing. I alone am appearing as this demon in my awareness. It will disappear after some time. Again, very easy to say. <laughs> this is what I think uh, the psychoanalysts used to do. You know, They would ask you to talk about it, talk about it, bring it to the conscious level. And slowly those complexes would loosen and disappear, hopefully. And then the... Then he says, when the mind becomes calm, neither scattered, nor sleepy, nor entranced by some kind of desire or past memory, when it's absolutely calm, calm means not thoughtless, aham brahmasmi, I am that one unflickering awareness all the time, that clarity is there, stay there, he says, na chalayet, don't disturb it any further, let it be there. There also, a certain bliss, a happiness will come. That also you have to reject. That will come, he'll say next. But something is bothering me. Let me just see. I just gave you the meaning of the Upanishad, but I made a mistake, I think. In the Katho Upanishad Bhashya, in the introduction, Shankaracharya gives you the meanings of the word Upanishad. Yes.
Right. So, three meanings of the word Upanishad. One is Visharana, which means destroy. It destroys ignorance. Second one is Gati. It means takes you to Brahman. Literally, it actually doesn't take you. It's not like a plane trip. It makes you realize that you are Brahman. And the last one, Avasadana, loosens the bonds of samsara. Even while you are studying, right now, it, the effect should be that samsara should weigh a little less heavily upon you. When something bad happens, when something good happens, your reaction is uh, you are outraged or you are very happy and excited. But after some time, it's all right. One Swami put it very nicely. He said, uh, what this Upanishad should do is change your reaction from what to so what. <laughs> uh, so that is our sadhana. It loosens the bonds of samsara. Then now let's go on to 45. Na swadayet sukham tatra Na swadayet sukham tatra Nisanga pragyaya bhavet Nisanga pragyaya bhavet Nishchalam nishcharat chittam Nishchalam nishcharat chittam Eki kuriyat prayatnata Eki kuriyat prayatnata Tatra when the mind is calm, there will bubble up a certain, we, we talked about it, rasaswada, the enjoyment of the happiness which comes from a peaceful mind, sattvic mind. Na swada rasam tatra. Don't get stuck there. Uh, so beautiful, so nice. Addicted to meditation. You say, Swami, that's nice. No, again, that's also an addiction. <laughs> then, such people have seen yogis. Uh, some monks who are very good meditators, but sometimes they become um, um, some kind of selfishness is there. My routine, my peace of mind, um, it dis don't disturb me. That happens, even without knowing it. It seems spiritual, which is also a kind of... See, world is, sometimes there will be disturbance, sometimes there will be no disturbance. Sometimes my mind will be peaceful, sometimes mind will not be peaceful. You are the Atman. You are one, the same undivided consciousness behind all minds. How many minds will you uh, make calm? You make one mind calm by meditation. What about the other seven billion minds of human beings? Forget the lion's mind and the elephant's mind. <laughs> all are sukshma sharidas. How much calmness is there? Nowhere. So you should not be so much worried about the calmness of the mind. Na swadayet sukham tatra. Don't get addicted to the calmness of the, calmness of the meditative mind also. Then Nisangaha bhavet. Be unattached. Great, great. One takeaway from this verse or even from today's class. This word, if you can take it, most of the problems of your life are solved right now. It's one practice. Nisangaha. Detachment. Detached from what? Unattached to what? Everything and every experience in life. Husband, wife, children, job, um, places to stay, your good experiences and yes, bad experiences, all come and go. Peaceful mind will go. Guaranteed. Meditative mind will go. Devotional mind, ah, wonderful, religious mind, spiritual mind will go. You might be shocked to hear that. It will go. Don't misunderstand me. This is Mandukya. Misunderstanding disastrous. Wait, let me finish. All will go except except you, you the Atman, the Atman, that existence consciousness place. Be aware of this. It's a simply a reporting of the fact. It's a fact. Why just our own little life? Life will also go. This body will go. The mind, it goes away every night. It will all go. And why, is, why make such a big fuss about it? Civilizations have gone. Imagine in this frame of history alone, from the beginning of Stone Age history, how many families, how many fathers and mothers and children and tribes and cities and civilizations, how many horrible things have happened, how many wonderful achievements, all gone, gone, gone. I am translating from Hindi. When Swami says, Jayega, Jayega, Jayega. It will go. Oh, you don't have to go. 
<laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm jo joking. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, that's, that's all right. <laughs> so it all goes. Don't be attached. And Advaita Vedanta tells you something more uh, interesting. If you are attached, the result is suffering. The result is suffering. None of these things have said that they belong to you. Neither anything in the world, nor anybody in the world. No, I belong to you. Lie. <laughs> you don't have the right to say that. You don't have the right to say that. It will go away. Persons will go away. Relationships go away. Places you stay. Everything goes away. Advaita Vedanta points out something very interesting. It sounds very hard, but no. Advaita Vedanta says you don't even have to do it. It's already an accomplished fact. You are unattached. You're made of Teflon. Nothing sticks to you. <laughs> you are already unattached. Even if you try to be attached, you cannot be attached. Nothing will stay with you. If you try to be attached, only one thing will happen is you will suffer. Your very nature is unattached. You are the Atman. The Atman is unattached. Nisangaha. The deepest meaning of this word Nisangaha is Satchidananda Brahma. Your very nature is always unattached. The greatest of movies, the most Oscar winning of performances, the most horrible of movies, the, great, the funniest of movies. Which character, which incident, what has stuck to the screen? After a movie, does somebody have to come with a pail of water and wash out the screen? Because it's become very messy. War movie, so many dead bodies, have to clean it out nicely, antiseptic. Nothing. <coughs> Nothing. There they gave, in the Himalayas, they gave the example of Shisha, the mirror. What sticks to the mirror? What can you see in the mirror? Everything in the world can be seen in the mirror. People coming and going, cars and birds and mountains and glaciers and the river. And all darkness and deep night and early morning, the sun rising and setting, all can be seen. What sticks to the mirror? No sun Nothing. Nothing. You are that consciousness in which nothing sticks. And hence, you are free. You are free. It, if you think about it, remember, nothing is being taken away from you. Your samsara is still, people get scared with Mandukya. <laughs> samsara is still there. Everything is there. But you are, now you are shown that you are actually free. Take this one word away from it. Don't tell people, I'm, from now on I am unattached to you. <laughs> no. Keep it as, a, as an attitude in your mind. I asked a very senior Swami under whom I, I trained when I joined the order. I didn't ask, somebody else asked him. Swami, what's your spiritual practice? Immediate answer came. He, answer came, detachment, nissangattva. One spiritual practice throughout life. And we saw, really, he meant it. I mean, day in and day out he demonstrated that. I remember once when that, you know, monks are always moving from place to place. And wherever our headquarters sends us, we go there. But when you are a new monk, like a novice, so the Swami you joined under is like, um, um, it's like father and mother because you have restarted your life, sort of rebooted your life. And this is the person you hold on to. Of course, that's not good. But it inevitably becomes like that because that impression falls very powerfully on you. So after two or three years in the ashram, the Swami under whom we trained, I when I joined, that Swami was transferred out. He was the head of the ashram. He was asked to go to the headquarters, the Belur Mat, where he is now the vice president of the order. But we saw he was there for 18 years. And we hardly knew until the last moment that he was going. He never told anyone. No farewell things, no uh, programs, you know, uh, like a farewell party or something. Um, in fact, once the teachers in the school, when they heard about it, they came rushing in a group and said, Swami, you must visit us, we'll organize a program. Why? And then he said, then they said, no, we at least do want to do pranams to you. Here are my feet, you can do it. Should I cut it out and send it to, to, to the school for you to do pranams? So that way. 
and the, then the, they quickly organized something. They had got gifts and stuff, and they came and gave it to him. He's quietly sat. He didn't make a scene of it. He quietly sat. They did pranams, and he blessed everybody. And then when he left, and we saw him off at the station, we came back. It was a big change for us. Um, already the new Swami was there. When we came back to the room, all the gifts, all of them, were exactly as they had been put in the room. He never touched one or opened a single, even opened a single one of them. Detached. Nisangatva. Absolutely. Another monk we saw, uh, he has passed away, so I can take his name, Bhavganalandaji, very scholarly old Swami. Um, it was said of him that for the last 40 years of his life, he never left the main monastery, never went outside the gates of the main monastery. 40 years. More than that, 50 years. I think once they took him to the hospital towards the end of his life. Otherwise, he never left the gate. And he, his routine, you could time it. With a, clock, with a watch, from morning till late night. Yet, yet, this person who has never left the monastery in his life in the last 40, 50 years, half a century, yet every day he would practice leaving the monastery. Not even attached to the monastery. At 5 o'clock every day, what he would do, the old Swami was bent over like this. He would uh, walk down to his room and whatever little positions he had, he would put on one ochre robe which, he, which, was, which served as his bed, uh, bed sheet. And then he would put his positions and would make quite a big bundle like this. And then tie up the bundle. And this old man, he would put the bundle on his shoulder and walk around the bed three times. And then open the bundle again and put the things back in there, perfectly in their place. What is the practice? Today I am thrown out. Nobody is going to throw him out. But anyway, if today I am asked to leave, I will walk out. It will take me five minutes to walk out forever. Sri Ramakrishna himself. See, attachment and detachment. It's not a question of being resentful or sullen. Oh, you're throwing me out. Okay, I will not come back again. I don't care about you. Not like that. So once, I think it was Hridaya Ram who was creating mischief and the, um, the uh, Mathur Babu, the son-in-law of Rani Rashmani, who was the executor of the estate, he sent word that this man has to be kicked, kicked out. Now, somehow it got lost. Miscommunication. So the guards who came, um, Sri Ramakrishna was after all, he was the priest of the temple. He was uh, not very high in the hierarchy or anything. He was very respected, that's all. So they came, Ridharam was his nephew. He was supposed to leave, but the guard came and said, the master has told, the Lord has asked you to leave. And Sri Ramakrishna was, are you sure? Yes. He didn't know anything, there was nothing, I mean, nothing brewing, he didn't even know, out of the blue. The moment he said yes, the guard said yes. Sri Ramakrishna didn't even wait to pack, no bundle also. He just put his like, chadar on his shoulder and started walking out. On the way, the mistake was understood and then they came running after him and they fell at his feet. Lord, uh, uh, Master, forgive us, it's our fault. Uh, do come back. He said, okay. And then he came back and he said... <laughs> <laughs> but when he was leaving, he was really leaving. If they had not stopped him, he would have never come back again. So that kind of nissangatvam. This is your very nature. Be true to your own nature. Then, don't walk out. When you have that kind of nissangatvam, you can live anywhere. In samsara, in the office, in the monastery. Anywhere. It, should, it will not be a problem to you. You still have the question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> in Adbul Dubar, I have an incident that lady, she loved her husband very much, but she lost her husband and it was in the cremation center. It was a big queue, okay? And her dead, dead body would take like 11 o'clock in the night because it's a big queue. And it was every day she eat 7 o'clock, 7.30. But the queue was very big, but she loved her husband more than anybody there. Uh, could show that we loved him because he was a very learned person, vice president, something like that. But she said when it was 6 o'clock, she came to know that dead body will be um, cremated. 11 o'clock, she said, let me go hmm. back home. The chef already prepared the food. Let me finish the food. I will come back because it is nothing to do here. Then when she left and came back, in the meantime, she picked up lots of pieces of everybody. But she was a true believer in... Uh, non-dualism and I was a young, 
I was thinking today, what kind of criticism in reality we should accept out of that? But she, did, she loved the most her husband. Mm. Nobody else. But yeah, she did I think I understand your question. Um, then what kind of criticism would be? Yeah, don't, don't take into account the criticism of the world. No. <laughs> you see? What? Uh, success and failure, criticism and praise, these are imposters. Ignore them. Just ignore them. But she is good, no? Yes, of course. Everybody is good. <laughs> no, so, uh, so do I. Don't worry. She is good. <laughs> All right. Now let's go on. Naswa dae sukham tatra. Do not get uh, trapped with the happiness in, in that calm state of mind. Be detached from that, that happiness also. Uh, that happiness is, it, can, it is also a range. It goes up to the maximum happiness of Sabhikalpa Samadhi, which Sri Ramakrishna was enjoying, what, uh, having the vision of Mother Kali. Be detached from that also. Anything that comes and goes, be detached. Not that you have to give it up. It will come and go in its own way. How will you be detached? How? Pragyaya bhavet. On the basis of what? What will you hold on to? You say Atman. Atman you already are. Pragya means the knowledge that you are that Atman. I am Brahman. Not a least bit is lost. If um, people go away, money goes away, reputation goes away, or good things come or bad things come, whatever comes and goes, need nothing in me the Atman, I am neither increased nor decreased by it. That knowledge. This knowledge which you have got from Vedanta, hold on to it. It's the most precious thing. Never compromise your spiritual understanding. Whether it be for money, some advantage in the world, for another person, for getting ahead in the world, never compromise. For karma, bhoga, for, for satisfying desires, for getting accomplishing things in the world, never compromise on the understanding that you have gained. Why? Because the, un the point of Vedanta is, the whole point of life is this understanding. This will ripen into realization. Then, nishchalam, when the mind is, make the mind steady, calm, concentrated. What are we aiming for here? Samadhi. Which Samadhi? Yogic Samadhi here. In that Aham Brahmasmi, that Samadhi we are aiming for. Remember again, for whom? Second group of seekers. Not the first group who, for whom they don't need this. Nischarat Chittam Eki Kuriya. And if the mind again goes out, it will. Naughty, naughty kid will try to run out of the house again. Stop. Pull it back again. Eki Kuriya. Merge it into your nature as Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. Back again. Eki Kuriya. Yatnata. Prayatnata. Make an effort. Make an effort. There. Then what happens? Samadhi will be the result. When you keep doing this morning and evening, every day you keep trying it. This is true of any method of meditation that you take up. A mantra meditation also or this kind of meditation. It will ultimately lead to Samadhi. 46. Describe Samadhi. Yada naliyate chittam Yada naliyate chittam Nacha vikshipyate punaha Nachavikshipyate punaha Aninganam anabhasam Aninganam anabhasam Nishpannam brahmatattada Nishpannam brahmatattada When the mind neither merges in sleep Yadana liyate chittam Nachavikshipyate punaha Nor gets distracted The first two obstacles And to that you should add the other two which are the other two? Does not get entranced by kashaya, the, the fourth, third one. And does not remain enjoying the happiness of a peaceful mind, rasaswada. When all of those four are overcome by long practice, this takes time. Then what happens? Aninganam manabhasam. Ingana, the word ingate means to, to shake, to vibrate, to shake. It becomes like a flame which is undisturbed. That's still vibrating. 
but like a flame which is burning. It's not extinguished, not fallen asleep, but absolutely unflickering, aninganam. It, what it li literally means, in the mind there is no vritti. No vritti is there. Vritti means movement of the mind, thought, feeling, except identification with aham brahmasmi. That one alone is there. Normally what happens, anything except aham brahmasmi. <laughs> there only that aham brahmasmi vritti is there. Or if you are doing a mantra meditation, your ishta devata and mantra will be there. Anabhasam. No object is there. Abhasa means appearance. What appears? Objects appear. Correct. Where do they appear? Consciousness. In consciousness. Right. We've got good Vedantic students here. <laughs> Otherwise people would say, what appears? The world appears? In the, wor in the world? No, even world appears in your consciousness. So no object appears. What about Brahman? Brahman is not an object. Atman? Atman is not an object. It is the pure subject. That never appears. Reflected face and real face. Put a mirror, you will see a reflection of your face. And that's a reflected face. That's not your real face. Ah, how to see the real face? You cannot. You can only be the real face. So when you remove all mirrors, when you shut down the mirror, the real face alone remains. And you remain with the awareness that here is the real face. You can't see it. Anabhasam, no appearance. No vritti. Appearance here means vritti vishaya. Every vritti of the mind has an object. Man vritti, woman vritti, car vritti, house vritti. Huh? All the thoughts that come to your mind, they are about something. Neither the thought is there, nor that about. Those things are also not there. Aninganam manabhasam. Very beautiful way of describing samadhi. Then, nishpannam brahmatattada. Then the mind itself remains as Brahman. The mind merges into Brahman or remains as Brahman. Remember, Mind remains as Brahman, don't be, uh, becomes Brahman, don't be confused. Mind is Brahman. Actually speaking, mind is Brahman, bro, bro, body is Brahman, the world is Brahman. After all, after all, if I show you a pot, a clay pot, and after all the analysis say, then the pot becomes clay, what does it mean? You realize that it is clay, it always was clay. You don't have to pound the pot into powder to make it clay. As it is, it is clay. The pot merges into clay. The wave merges into water. What do you mean wave merges into water? Does it mean that the wave will subside back into the water? No, no, no. The wave can remain as the wave. You realize it is water. The mind remains as mind. But you realize it is nothing other than Brahman. When you see a snake, in classic example, snake in the rope. The snake merges back into the rope. Has something happened actually? Nothing. You just realize it's the rope. You just realize mind is also Brahman. <coughs> Sri Ramakrishna put it in his own way, Shuddha Mon, Shuddha Buddhi, Shuddha Atma. The pure Atman, Satchidananda, and the pure mind are one and the same. People get confused. Vedanta does not say that mind is different, Atma is different. Only beginners, kindergarten, not Mandukya Vedantins. Mandukya Vedantins will say, yes, Brahma Tad Nishpannam Tad Mind itself reveals itself as Brahman. Just as the pot reveals itself as clay. What does the pot have to do to become clay? What does the wave have to do to become water? Stop being so wavy. <laughs> huh? No. It, is, it just realizes. It is, was and is. Helplessly it is water. Pot is helplessly clay. So the gold ornament is helplessly gold. The mind is helplessly chittam chiditi vijaniyat. Know that, realize that the mind itself is pure consciousness. Pure consciousness alone appears as the mind. Then, 47. This is the last but one. I'll come to you. Hold on to the question. Samadhi. As a result of Samadhi, what happens? Swastham shantam sanirvanam. Swastham shantam sanirvanam. Akatyam sukham Akatyam sukham uttamam Ajam ajena gena Ajam ajena gena Sarvagyam parichakshate Sarvagyam parichakshate Parichakshate, the teachers of Brahman, the masters of Vedanta, they teach us this. What remains after this when the mind is stilled in Brahman? What does the second class of uh, seekers? 
what do they realize? Shantam. Shantam means peace itself. This Shantam is from the seventh mantra of the Mandukya Upanishad. Shantam Shivam Advaitam Chaturtam Manyante. Do you remember Nanta Pragyam Nabahish Pragyam? Shantam. This, here Shantam means forever beyond suffering. This Brahman is forever. Oh, now it is beyond suffering. No, no, no. Earlier it was suffering so much. No, no, no. Brahman was always beyond suffering. You, Brahman, you are, you were always beyond suffering. Shantam. Swastham. Established in itself. What does established in itself mean? Brahman is neither karya nor karana. Brahman is not produced by anything else. What is the cause of Brahman? Like you say, you know, who, God made the world. The kid will ask, who made God? No, nobody made God. So Brahman is the only reality. Nothing made Brahman. And, and also, Brahman does not make anything. Contrary to traditional religious belief. God is the creator of the world. Higher belief, God alone is. There is no world to be created. But the world appears in God. Brahman is swastham, neither cause nor effect, non-dual, advaitam, established in itself. Swast means titam, swastham, established in itself. Swatmani stitam, even better, Shankaracharya says, Swatmani stitam, established in the self. Itself, what is that itself? The self, you. Sanirvanam, this is moksha, nirvana here means moksha. This is moksha. Yes, you had a question? Yeah, I had a clarification. Yes. Just, so you told that when in a state uh, where you have only one vritti, then it's said to be like it's concentrated. Yes. So then, but you also again said after a few sentences that vritti is associated with the object. Yes. So then what is the object in that? No, no object at all. The vritti becomes focused on aham brahmasmi, so that, that vritti has no object at all. That vritti melts back into pure consciousness. So it is uh, um, uh, objectless basically. Uh, because Atman, you can say Atman is the object. Here it says, Ajam Majena Gena. Brahman is the thing to be known. So what is the object of that Aham Brahma Spiriti? That I am Brahman, that is the object. But it's not an object. Brahman is not an object. So that Vritti remains without uh, any object, without any object here means what is the definition of an object anatma not self but here the object itself is the subject atma is the object itself so you but you can't call atma the object yes can't help but think that as i listen to more of mandukya i feel bad for heidegger because had he read mandukya he probably wouldn't have well he would have saved a lot of effort uh, it is true i mean in fact heidegger was the first Western philosopher after, I think, Plato or something in the last 2000 years who considered the question of existence itself. All other philosophers, including Indian philosophers also, consider the question of things which exist. Substance, quality, God, universe. But what is existence itself? It's only Advaita Vitta which talks about it. Advaita Vedanta. And Heidegger in the, in the uh, 20th century. He got mixed up with Hitler and his folks, so he has a very bad name. But it was probably, if he had not got mixed up with uh, the Nazis, probably the greatest Western philosopher in the 20th century. Uh, but we were just discussing him in a discussion a few days ago in, in, a, con in a meeting of philosophers on the East Side. Um, Heidegger talk, talk, uh, talked about being, but the way, immediately after that he talked about being... Uh, the, the, the way a way of being in the world way of being in the world you already made a jump from being itself to a particular mode of being um, and then he becomes enmeshed in the different ways in which being can exist in the world and so on and so forth but he got these ideas being precedes essence he says uh, essence means the unique characteristic of each each person uh, that before that it is just existence. Then only we have the unique characteristics which make us separate from each other. This is, this is kindergarten Advaita. This we have left behind far long ago. But yes. Uh, anyway, that's why I mentioned to David Chalmers in this NYU workshop on attention that uh, these two, from a Vedantic perspective, there are two interesting questions in Western philosophy that we see now. 
One is Heidegger asked about being. The conclusions he came to are different, but the question he asked about being, what is being itself? And what you, David Chalmers, have raised in this <laughs> uh, late 20th century, what is consciousness? Answers we'll see later, but the two questions are very important. One is about Sat, one is about Chit. Which comes first? Neither. <laughs> in our, in our think about it this way. I'll give you two answers. And this is a very good question, which comes first? In the waking perspective, this waking world, you would say existence comes first. You exist, then you are aware. Is it not true? Here are things which exist, and then we become aware of them. The Vedanta society exists, and you come and become aware of the Vedanta society. That's the common sense way in which we treat the world. We fall asleep. We are pretty convinced that the room and the bed and everything continue to exist when we are sleeping. And when we come, become awake again, we become aware of that which was already existing. Isn't that the common way we deal with it? That's the waking paradigm. Advaita, see how it problematizes the whole thing. You see, that's the waking paradigm. But how do you look at your dreams? In your dream paradigm, it is consciousness first, awareness first, then only things come into existence. You are aware, then only you can dream. And everything that you dream about, they did not exist earlier. They come into being supported by your awareness. So awareness comes first in dream. Then only things exist. Existence comes first in the waking order. But then what is truth? The truth is both existence and awareness in themselves, they are one reality only. All right, let's go on. Yes, question. Yes. Yes. But as a side effect, you're also getting peace and happiness because there's some joy listening to Vedanta. Side benefits, not effect. Uh, <laughs> side side benefits. benefits. So what is this? I'm confused about. Uh, this, this is this is that is true. You are a Vedantic student, and uh, I have taken the message of Vedanta to heart. I have got some clarity about it. I like it, and I'm practicing regularly. So this is the way things should develop, definitely. Yeah. <coughs> this, this, will, this is itself detachment. When you find that, but consciously if you do that, from this perspective, this Vedantic understanding, if you consciously do that, you will find detachment is very easy. It's natural. Yes. Yeah, so we find there are different stages of, in Jivan Mukti, we find different stages. Um, seven stages they talk about, if, what are they? Um, Shubhecha, Vish, Vicharana, um, Tanumanasa, Sattvapatti. In the, there are three final stages after enlightenment, after realization, three final stages are there. The three stages are, one, a per person can be merged or the mind becomes merged in the self, aham brahmasmi, or, or the thought of the divine, it becomes merged in samadhi for some time. And then again the mind becomes active and that person comes out of samadhi by himself or herself. You don't have to do anything. That's one. The second deeper state is where the person will not come out by himself or herself. Then you have to do something to make that person come out. Somebody from outside. So... Sometimes Sri Ramakrishna would go into Samadhi in different ways, depending upon if he's listening to a song about Krishna, he's gone into Samadhi absorbed in the thought of Krishna. Listening to something about Kali, he's gone into Samadhi absorbed in the thought of Kali. Then the mantra of that particular deity has to be chanted loudly. It's not that he's unconscious, he's fully conscious, but not conscious of this apparent world. That pulls the mind back to this, this world of appearances. Then there is a deepest <coughs> level of Samadhi, where the person will not come back anymore. E by himself he will not come back. Even if you try from outside also he will not come back. And there Sri Ramakrishna says after 21 days the body falls off. This is like a dry leaf, the body falls off. 
So that's the deepest absorption. But remember, these are not stages of realization. These are stages of the mind. The mind being absorbed in, in uh, jnana is the same. Whether mind in the, in the six, that is um, seven stages. Five, four, five, five, six, seven. So in the fifth stage also, this person has got realization. I am Brahman. Sixth stage also same realization. Seventh stage also same realization. The difference is in the absorption of the mind. Okay. Um, you have a question? Yes. Let, let me finish this. I'll hold on to the question. Sanirvanam. This is moksha. This is moksha. As long as the body will be alive, you will call this person uh, Jivan Mukta. Enlightened, uh, free while living. Jivan Mukta. And when this person, the body dies, you call this person Videha Mukta. Liber liberated after death. But from that person's own point of view, you are already free. Always were free. For that person, Jivan Mukti and Videya Mukti make no difference from that per from the enlightened person's perspective. I am Brahman, that person knows. It's only from our perspective we say, oh, he's enlightened in the body. From that person's perspective, in the body, outside the body makes no sense. It's Brahman and Brahman alone. So, uh, this is called Sanirvanam. Akatyam Sukham Uttamam. Akatyam, inexpressible. Avang Manasa Gochara, beyond language, beyond conception. So he is saying Akatyam also in ordinary Indian languages means the unspeakable, you know, abusive words, <laughs> what you should not speak. Here Akatyam means that which cannot be spoken. Sukham Uttamam, the highest bliss. Showing here, this is not the bliss of Samadhi which was being spoken of earlier. It's not that bliss where you should not get attached to it. Rasaswada, don't get attached to it. Not that bliss. Sukham Uttamam here is Ananda Swarupam, Brahman itself. Brahman itself. It's not like, the difference is this, it's not like the face in the mirror. It's like the original face. The face in the mirror has an advantage though. Can you tell me what it is? You can? See. You can see it. The original face you cannot see. <coughs> Are you with me? Yes. Huh? Original face you cannot see. But the problem with the reflected face are many. One is, it will come and go. Will it, will it not? It will come and go. And it depends on the mirror. Sometimes the face, you see convex mirror, you'll start laughing the how your face looks. Concave, the trick mirrors are there. Concave mirror, convex. So depending on the reflector, your, that reflection also will change. The quality of the reflection will be different. And also, worst of all, the reflected face is not the real face. It's a reflection. It's not real. Similarly, Ananda. The Ananda which is Brahman. Brahmananda is not an experience, not a thing to be experienced. It is you yourself. It is infinite and you yourself. That's the advantage. And the uh, disadvantage is it cannot be experienced as a thing. So does that mean uh, when you realize yourself as Brahman, Brahmananda, you will not be happy? Of course you will be happy. Rather, you will not care about that, uh, that reflected bliss. And the reflected bliss in the mind has many problems. Just like the reflected face in the mirror. What happens to it? It comes and goes. One. It increases and decreases. Two. There's little happiness, more happiness, <laughs> tremendous happiness. But they're all reflected. And finally, it is an appearance. It's not real in itself. It's an appearance of you, the Brahmananda. Sukham Uttamam. Wait, let me finish this. And this is very beautiful. Ajam, ajay, nagen, nagenya, the thing to be known. The thing to be known is not a thing and it cannot be known. That's the problem. <laughs> the thing to be known is Brahman. But it's not a thing. It is you. And it cannot be known as an object. You realize it as yourself. How is it known? Ajam, ajayna. The unborn is known by the unborn. Very beautiful expression. Sri Ramakrishna says almost the exact same thing. Awareness becoming aware of itself. Bodhe bodhkara. The final thing which Sri Ramakrishna has said about enlightenment is exactly this. How is this enlightenment? The non-dual realization. Sri Ramakrishna says, Bodhe Bodhkara. Bodha means consciousness. Becoming aware of awareness. Becoming conscious of yourself as consciousness. That's the only way to put it. Not even through the mind. Even there the mind falls silent. Ajam ajena gena. Sarvagyam. Sarvagyam here means sarvascha gyascha. All, the entire universe is nothing but that. And that, what is that? Gya, consciousness. It is consciusness alone. Parichakshate, the enlightened ones, 
teach us thus. The wise ones teach us thus. There is only one verse left, which is, here he concludes the topic of closed eye meditation. Enough to make your eyes close <laughs> in despair. No, closed eyes meditation topic, that is yogic meditation on Vedantic realization. That is com completed here. And the last verse, he will sum up the entire teaching of Advaita Prakaranam, which I have reserved for the next class, where I will give that verse and sum up the entire teaching of this chapter. Okay, there were two questions. I saw hands. You and you, yes. I think you hinted on it just now. Yes. Uh, so, the, the clay pot metaphor is, is a good framework to understand um, Brahman as existence. Yes. The Mandukya framework is a good, uh, uh, excellent framework to understand Brahman as consciousness. Yes. What about bliss? So, can bliss all uh, only be understood if you are realized, enlightened? No, no, you can understand now itself. You, I refer you to, I, I know I have not talked about it as much as I talk about Brahman as existence, Brahman as consciousness. I keep talking about that. Vedanta also does that. But if you look at Taittiriya uh, Upanishad, uh, Ananda Mimamsa, I have given a couple of talks on this. If you search in search of bliss, you have to search for my talk in search of bliss. <laughs> you have to be in search of the search of bliss. Uh, there I have talked about Brahman as Ananda. Look at it this way. See, I'll tell you the Hindi, if you understand Hindi. I'll tell you Hindi and then translate for the benefit of others. So how they teach it, it's so precise. If you catch it, you, you basically, at the very least, the understanding of Advaita will be clear. He says, this teacher, uh, in Hindi, he said, Anand ko vishaya mat banao, gyan ko akar mat do, aur satta ko vikar mat do. What does it mean? Satta ko vikar mat do. Satta means existence. Stop there. Don't go to vikar means effect. So, Brahman alone, pure being, but then it becomes the five elements, akasha, vayu, agni. This is called vikara, effect. Then samsara starts. When you take, the, let the pot be there, but when you take your attention away from the clay to the pot name and form, you have gone to vikara. Vikara means kar, karyam. When you realize the pot is nothing other than the clay, when you realize this entire universe is nothing other than Brahman, there's not a little bit more here other than Brahman, then you have, you have negated vikara. Vikara means karya, effect. That's what Aj uh, Advaita is, Godapada is doing, Ajatavada. Karya, karana, vilakshana, Brahma. No cause, no effect, non-dual. The moment you have cause and effect, God created the universe, duality comes. The pot, clay and pot, is it dual or non-dual? But I've said two things, clay and pot. Depends on the perspective. In the, uh, in the real world, or sort of... In no world are they two. No. In the unreal world. I mean, Even in the unreal world, they're not two. Can you... I'm taking, I'm taking an example of the unreal world. In, in uh, Advaita, there is no clay or no pot. But uh, in, in our world, right now, if I give you a clay pot, am I giving you two things or one thing? One thing. One thing. But I've used two names, pot and clay. Which one will you use? We'll use pot because of form. Yes, but knowing that? The underlying substance is huh. clay. Even don't use underlying. But underlying what? Underlying nothing. It's like you saying there's something and underlying it is clay. No, there's only one thing. <laughs> right. So it is non-dual. And the whole of Advaita is to make you see the pot is nothing but clay. At the same time, maintaining the form of the pot, maintaining the use of the pot, and maintaining the name pot. Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara continues. This is the beauty of Advaita. It does not say you have to pound the pot into uh, pot shirts and make it a powder and then only you can call it clay. No. As the pot, using the pot, calling it a pot, treasuring the pot, you can call it clay and know that it is nothing but clay. This is Advaita. This is, he says, Satta ko vikar mat do. Don't, don't, Make products out of, don't make the, don't, don't make being a creator. Vikara means change, effect. Gyan ko akar mat do. Very beautiful. This one of these phrases can lead you straight to enlightenment, or at least to a very clear understanding of Advaita. What is Gyana? Awareness, consciousness. What is akara? Form. Now consciousness, with, this is what our experience is. Consciousness plus form. Isn't it? What you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, they are all forms in consciousness. 
Are you with me? Yeah. What else is it? You'll say, no, suppose somebody will say, Bill will tell me that before human beings, or Bill is looking surprised, why me? <laughs> before human beings originated, the universe existed for billions of years. There was no consciousness there. How can you say universe is in consciousness? Answer is simple. Where are you saying it right now? In your consciousness. You have made up the mind before I was, the universe was. But where did you make up your mind? In consciousness. Mm -hmm. No, you are just playing with words. Where are you playing with words? In consciousness. <laughs> where have you decided? There was billions of years without consciousness. Then only life originated. Then only consciousness originated. Who decides this? Consciousness. Stick to experience. Gyan ko akar mat do. You say akar of forms are already there in consciousness. What do I do? How do I remove them? Are you following me? Yes. How do I remove the appearances which are already there? In you said don't give appearances to consciousness. It would be nice if I could do that Swami. But I can't stop it. If you try to stop it, you are a yogi. If you understand that you need not stop it, you are a jnani. If you try to stop it, I want nirvikalpa samadhi. I want to remove all the appearances from uh, consciousness. You are a yogi. Why do you want to remove the appearances? They are disturbing, they are very bad. They are nothing other than the underlying consciousness. Yeah. Madhusudan Saraswati in his Bhagavad Gita commentary, Gurata Deepika, he, d he suddenly goes off on this track and he says, there are these two approaches basically. One is the approach of the yogi. He says the followers of Hiranyagarbha, that is Sankhya and Patanjala. They regard the world as real. For them there is no other way except Nirvikalpa Samadhi, he says. They have to shut out the world to experience themselves as pure consciousness. Then he says, there are the followers, he says followers of the Vedas, the Vedic path, who realize that the world is nothing but an appearance in Brahman. So Brahman alone exists, let it appear, let it appear, in Hindi they put it very nicely, hajar man lakh man purpurai, isme tumko kya? Let a million minds bubble forth, how many minds will you put in samadhi? They call it whack-a-mole, like this, something it comes up. How many minds are coming up? Put them into Samadhi. Another comes up. Put it into Samadhi. You can't do it. But it's not necessary. Jnani will say that. Jnana ko akar maddo means when the akar is there. There you see it's only Jnana is there. Only consciousness is there. The akar is nothing separate from Jnana. Then you come back to your question. Anand ko vishaya maddo. Yeah, vishaya mein anand maddo. No, no the exact word was Anand ko vishaya mat banao. Anand ko vishaya mat. Don't make Anand an object to be enjoyed. Detachment. Ah. No, then you realize that you are Anand itself. Ah. Completion. It's like saying, uh, the example is this. Reflected face. Do you ever feel, when you see your face in the mirror, ah, very nice. Good. But do you ever feel tension? If I go away, my God, it will go away. I have to remain here all the time. Otherwise, face will go away. You ever feel that? No. You know, my face is here. Doesn't matter. That reflected face may be there, may not be there. It may be a shiny reflection, may be an um, obscure reflection. Doesn't matter because my real face is here, though I can't see it. Similarly, more ananda, less ananda, divine ananda, worldly ananda, no ananda. I don't care. Those are all tiny reflections of the infinite which I am. Not theoretically, actually. So that is what, that is the Vedantic understanding of ananda. Yes, the gentleman there. Yes. In order to find out uh, yes. subtension, that's why there's a question. Yes. Existence and awareness. Can we say that uh, existence is more on ontological level? Yes. And, and when we want to find a awareness or chief, it's more epistemological level? True, if you, the approach will be ontological, approach will be epistemological. Mm -hmm. You see, Drik Drishya Vivek is epistemological. Mm -hmm. The Chandogya approach to Sadeva Sammedamagras, you know, Tattvamasi, that is ontological. But the beauty of Advaita is when you actually find it, you find that Satchidananda is the same thing. From it arises ontology, epistemology and axiology. See, from Sat arises ontology. Ontos means being, existence. 
everything that exists. Ontology is from Sat. Epistemology is from Chit, I mean knowledge. And value, happiness, pleasure, that is from Ananda, axiology, values. The whole of philosophy, ontology, epistemology, axiology. You notice how you pursue anything, you will end up with Brahman, Sat, Chit or Ananda. Very good question. All right, let's end with that very beautiful note. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanam Astu So do come for the next class. We'll have a nice summing up of the entire teaching. A third chapter teaching.